Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the uh, Urban Festival for 2021. Uh, and uh, a big thank you to everybody for joining us. Uh, we've got about uh, just under 40 people on the call. Um, and it's great to have you all this morning. My, my name is Ayabong Atawe. I'm an economist and a broadcaster. Uh, and it gives me great joy this morning to be your uh, MC. We're going to get uh, some uh, remarks from uh, the organizers of this uh, event, the South African Cities Network, uh, who have organized it alongside generous support and collaboration with the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs. Um, and uh, really a great pleasure uh, also to have worked alongside Salga and the Department of Human Settlements as well in putting this together. We'll also be joined uh, shortly by uh, uh, urbanist Rashik Fatah of our Future Cities, and he's going to join us in a discussion uh, with uh, uh, the South African Cities Network's uh, Stolem Banga. Uh, and it's really a great pleasure once again to, to have you all uh, with us this morning. This is really a platform for learning, experimentation, and really knowledge exchange around a range of few areas uh, that are really focused on implementing a transformative urban agenda. And the festival uh, really is around trying to enable active dialogue between different uh, uh, actors in the urban ecosystem and it's hosted in the month of October uh, because that coincides with UN Habitat's uh, World Cities Day, which is the 31st of October, uh, which is coming up in the next few days or so. So the 2021 edition is a three-day uh, conference uh, with three community project activations that are happening countrywide um, and a poster competition and a series of partner and other events uh, that uh, form part of the urban month for 2021. Now, without further ado, uh, we will get opening remarks from uh, the Honorable Deputy Minister uh, and Dade Obed Bapela, uh, who is uh, the Deputy Minister in the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs. And Dade Bapela, without uh, uh, any further delay, uh, let me welcome you uh, as you uh, come forward to make uh, some remarks to open our festival for 2021. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Uh, Mr. Kawe, the leadership of the Cities Network, the national policy makers that are present here, our partners, international organizations, the civil society, private sector, academia, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I have the privilege to welcome you on behalf of the people and government of South Africa on this annual Urban Festival 2021. The department together with South Africa Cities Network have been hosting this conference together with other key development uh, urban actors. Allow me to extend my greetings this morning to all of you to welcome you to this Urban Festival 2021, hosted virtually and has been morphed into a month long festival. The festival is hosted during the October month, which is also known as Urban Month. Festiv the festival is, aims to provide a platform for learning, experimentation, and knowledge exchange on the implementation of a transformative agenda. And then I'm glad that some of the scholars uh, that are going to be participating will be listening to them throughout the day, and then also the following day when it, it continues. As we commemorate this second edition of the Urban Festival 2021, I would like to acknowledge all partners, starting with my department, the Department of Human, uh, uh, the, the Department of COCTA, Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, and also the Department of Human Water and Sanitation, the National Treasury, South African Local Government Association, SALGA, our future cities, CVTech Africa, and ICLEI. All these distinguished guests, global and local, who have joined in to celebrate with us Urban October, the Transport Month also as uh, other activities are unfolding in that area. We are also in the midst of the UN Habitat 40 Day Safer Cities Challenge, an annual international campaign that starts uh, on the 20, on, that starts very soon. September is also known as the International Day of Peace, 
and it runs until the 31st of October and leading to the World Cities Day, which is on the 31st of October 2021. You will see that there are so many activities that are calling on us to continuously reflect, pose, and engage and discuss uh, in terms of the kind of the cities that we'll want to see emerging and, and then going forward. As the month of October is an urban month, a period concentrates on urban development programs globally. Uh, that is the UN Habitats World Cities Day, as I've already mentioned, which hosts a series of events for the whole month, the National Transport Month and the World Urbanization, uh, Urbanism. Uh, Town Planning Day is also factored in, which is on the 8th of November. Therefore, this virtual festival has en enabled the extension of conversation to a wider audience on this very important key subject. In the wake of COVID-19 pandemic, the conferences has moved to virtual platforms and, 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 and we are here unfortunately not able to meet uh, physically, but hoping that with uh, vaccination, though with reluctance in some quarters, uh, we'll be able to go back to the norm, but under the, the new norms because the new norm, it seems like it has, been, it has imposed itself on human beings. Allow me just to quote from George Patton, uh, who then says, and I quote, do not try to make circumstances fit your plans, but make plans that fit the circumstances. We are in uh, circumstantial situations, and we really need to then develop plans that fit this particular occasion. The new urban agenda, which can be considered as a global manifesto, indicates that cities can be the source of solutions to rather than the cause of the challenges that our world is facing today. We really ought to then begin to provide those particular solutions and not just see challenges and challenges all the time. There are solutions that can really arise. If well-planned and well-managed, urbanization can be a powerful tool for sustainable development for both developing and developed countries. It is from this vantage point that we have decided to theme the 2021 festival, Rebuilding Sustainable Cities. The theme for the 2021 urban festival, as said already, Rebuilding Sustainable and Resilient Cities, pose the past crisis. This year's theme is aligned to the UN Heritage theme for World Cities Day 2021, which is adapting cities for climate resilience, which is a theme that will be celebrated globally. The Urban Festival aims to bring local and global urban actors together. The discussion during the Urban Festival will obviously focus amongst others, the rebuilding sustainable cities, towns and governing post COVID-19. Two, how do we make cities, towns, leave us to create sustainable employment opportunities for the youth who are now the biggest number in the population. Through a city story through the state of cities report lens that will also be told. For how to urbanize sustainably in an inclusive way so that the cities do not just belong to those who are wealthy and well off, but then they are as inclusive as possible, including uh, embracing the cultures the traditions of our own people. Uh, five, decent decentralization in a time of post recovery. Uh, six, reimagining our new future cities post the pandemic. We need to do a lot of reimagining in this particular area. Uh, eight, climate smart cities, towns, and the dec decarbonized cities as climate changes with us, we ought to really begin to look at this. And then also, what does urban resilience look like post COVID-19 as another subject matter? Innovation through smart city interventions and the integrated urban development framework in action, which is a community-led initiative. So we should not leave our communities behind in some of this particular discussion and debates. In this year's urban festival, we aim to also show continuity from the previous year's festival through flashbacks on the commitments, the promissory notes made on how to transform the urban agenda and tell the story of the impact that has been made since the 2020 festival. 
Cooperative governance and traditional affairs vision is to build a functional and developmental local government system in South Africa that delivers on its constitutional and legislative mandates within a system of cooperative governance. And I think on this, we'll also be introducing the new model that the president has already launched called the district development model. The, U, the IUDF vision is to create cities that are livable, safe, socially integrated, economically inclusive, and globally competitive, where residents actively participate in urban life. The vision of South Africa's and urban areas recognizes the country has different types of cities and towns which have different roles and requirements. That diversity ought to be embraced also, so that we don't just build cities for the sake of building, but we also look at the different types, the, 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 the aspirations, the roles, the requirements, including in some instances reviving some of the ancient cities that are now being discovered in South Africa. We have partnered with the UN Habitat on the implementation of the district development model towards the integrated one plans. Uh, this is a model that we are now uh, uh, implementing here in South Africa, uh, one plan, one budget, We're hoping therefore that it will then cascade into national departments, provincial departments, working with municipalities, at the local level under a district. And then the districts are 44 in number in South Africa with eight metropolitans. As we govern, we're also transforming the way we work to deliver infrastructure and services as one government through the district development model. This will see much improved government coordination. Together with the IUDF, the DDM as the district development model is acronyms, will provide leadership in changing the way we work as government to ensure transformation in our communities. In conclusion, program director, I've been informed by Mr. Mbanga that the new urban agenda, which can be considered as a global manifesto, indicates that uh, cities are the source of solutions. If well-planned and well-managed, urbanization can be a powerful tool for sustainable development for both developing and developed countries. In this, for, from this vantage point that the festival theme is rebuilding sustainable, sustainable cities, it is my utmost pleasure to officially declare the 2021 Urban Festival open. Let the deliberations and creative ideas flow as we engage in innovation for building our cities. Let the festival enable active dialogue between a range of urban actors. I wish you well in our deliberations and wish to thank the organizers for having ably steered the ship to have this 2021 festival. I thank you. I have tried to speak all languages. Program director. Deputy Minister. <laughs> uh, thank you very much uh, for those uh, uh, welcoming remarks and, of course, for opening uh, our festival for 2021. Uh, and uh, uh, also, I guess, touching on some of the things that are being done in South Africa to, to rethink, reinvent and rebuild our cities uh, at a very, very difficult moment that we faced with, with COVID-19. Uh, but also on uh, very growing demands on uh, the capability of cities to hold all of us uh, and i think the, the questions of resilience and the ability of our cities to respond to that uh, is something that uh, uh, many of the participants in this festival over the next few days uh, will be trying to grapple with so thank you very much uh, deputy minister uh, obed bapela for that uh, arousing welcome uh, and uh, we now shift uh, our attention uh, to uh, our discussion uh, with uh, the ceo of uh, the South African Cities Network, also going to be joined by the curator of this festival, uh, Rashik Fatah, uh, uh, in uh, what is certainly said to be, uh, I guess, a discussion to try and better understand how uh, uh, the next three days are going to be uh, mapped out and planned out, but more importantly, uh, in line with our theme, uh, what this festival has to grapple with as we try to rethink, reinvent, and rebuild our cities. So once again, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Minister, for that opening welcome. And uh, let me, uh, I guess, uh, join everybody in bringing closer uh, the uh, CEO of the South African Cities Networks, Tolem Banga, and uh, the curator uh, who joins us as well from uh, Future Cities, uh, Rashik Fatah. Um, and I want to maybe start off uh, with you, CEO. 
um, you know, under the theme of our uh, um, discussions today, when we talk about rebuilding our cities or reinventing them uh, in response to the shifting and changing context um, and the circumstances that the Deputy Minister was speaking to, uh, what are some of the things that we're looking to rebuild uh, from what you've seen in the work that you've done across uh, uh, particularly our eight metros uh, and of course the linkages they have with many of the other 44 districts uh, within the district development model that uh, the deputy minister was speaking about what are we re rebuilding um, and to what end Ayabonga, thanks very much uh, uh, to you for, for for doing the mc of this but i think it's important for me to first thank the deputy minister for uh, having ably uh, opened the, 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 the three-day conference, which conference is held within the framework of um, international solidarity, humanity. I mean, South Africa is not the only country in the world that is facing urbanization. The entire globe is facing uh, urbanization. And I think if you listened to Deputy Minister Babela's opening remarks, he quotes and um, he talks in the quote, he talks about the need for us to make plans that fit the circumstances, right? And uh, as I listened, it, it dawned on me that it's important as we hold this conference to unpack what we mean by the circumstances. And my contribution to, to, to that question is the circumstances that we, I can think of at least three issues, and I'm sure there's more and we can package them, you know. Um, the first is the fact that as society and particularly as local governments, all local governments, all governments generally, uh, and all of society, we live in an emergency governance mode, right? And it's not, it's not, it's not just about COVID. COVID has been the, the most recent wave of many waves that have contributed to this emergency governance. In the South African Cities Network and in how in conjunction with other partners like the uh, United Cities and Local Governments, UCLG, uh, the London School of Economics, we have coined the term emergency governance to be reflective of at least a period of 15 years in which there have been waves and waves and waves of crisis, right? Um, starting uh, perhaps even before, but the one mark is the 2008 global financial meltdown. I mean, that had a dire uh, impact on South Africa's local governments because it was a financial meltdown and most of our municipalities for their own institutional sustainability rely on a international platform of finances that is stable. It had suddenly become unstable. And then came um, the climate change uh, wave, which still impacts on the institutional sustainability of municipalities as we speak now. If, if, you, if you go back to the white paper on local government, for instance, it talks about the need for local governments in South Africa to be independent of the national fiscus. And in the funding formula, it presupposes uh, that municipalities will continually be able to reticulate electricity and water and all the other basic services. And yet those are not in the control of local governments. And then climate change hits. So suddenly we run out of water in Cape Town, in Grebecha, the, the better part um, of the Eastern Cape, Johannesburg or the Gauteng city region. So suddenly we're unable to provide this and this adds to, to, to the crisis. So you've got a financial problem and suddenly you've got a big climate change problem, which also then impacts on the foundations of the economy. Um, and then thirdly, I can think of, of, in fact, before that, I've spoken about uh, the health crisis that we're in, which is, uh, so you can imagine over a period of 15 years, if you are a mayor or a city manager, you've had to govern, right, under these circumstances. It's quite tough, as it were. And that's, that's part and parcel of what Deputy Minister calls the need for us to make plans that respond to these circumstances 
And imagine trying to do this into the long term. The last thing that I must make mention of is the issue of social coherence, right? Which um, it, it plays itself out in xenophobic behaviors. The last one in, 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 in Kabecha most recently, where people suddenly begin to, to, to go into their um, cultural or tribal or racial lagers in order to protect themselves from circumstances that ordinarily they are unable to contend with. So for me, that would be the contribution of what are these circumstances that we are, are supposed to be responding to. And hopefully, with platforms such as the Urban Festival, um, we ought to be able to then think through this and come and co-create solutions and ideate on what's the best policies, instruments that we must put in place, what are the best plans, and the district development model is something that has been espoused by, by, by our government to that effect. Thank you very much, CEO, for those remarks. Uh, and, and I definitely think that, you know, I mean, I was in Krabeja over the last few days or so. And what becomes very apparent when we talk about these circumstances uh, is that, yes, there are the shocks, as you speak to. I mean, the climate crisis, 2007, 8, COVID-19, which, you know, I guess, place us in these emergency situations. But I would also think that there are these chronic stresses over a long period of time. Um, this issue around, of course, you know, infrastructure, um, capital spending around infrastructure and its maintenance. And it's something I want us to come back to. Um, now, ladies and gentlemen, that is Tolembanga. He's the CEO uh, of uh, the South African Cities Network. He's been there since 2002 uh, and certainly one of the uh, very knowledgeable people in, in our society around the evolution, of course, of our municipal system. And uh, we'll come back also to some of what he raises, uh, which emerged in a 1998 white paper on local government. Uh, which really, in a sense, I guess, was the blueprint in early form uh, of the uh, you know, multi-tiered local government system that we have. Let me bring in now uh, Rashik Fatah. Uh, he's our curator of uh, this uh, three-day festival that we have here. He's a passionate urbanist, he's CEO of Future Cities Consultants, uh, also an actuary. And uh, maybe he, he'll tell us, I guess, how he got into uh, the world of uh, urban design uh, and, uh, of course, uh, rethinking questions of sustainability and resilience uh, in many of our cities. Uh, and I think, Rashik, I mean, for me, the first question that I have for you um, would be around this issue of how do we design space? How do we think about space in the context of some of these circumstances that Stolle and the Deputy Minister were speaking about? Not in the sense just of the shocks, but also, I guess, the chronic uh, stresses that develop over time. Um, and in the case, for instance, of social cohesion, what happens when there's a withering away of the social fabric coming, of, of course, from, from the divided history that we come from. Uh, thank you, Ayabonga, and uh, thank you to the Deputy Honorable Minister for joining us and uh, uh, the incredible CEO of SSC's network and Dr. Leander as well. Uh, and uh, all the guests and our teams joining us from, from around the country. I just wanted to start by sharing, um, uh, I was having a conversation with a city official. I won't mention which city, but, uh, uh, you know, the, they were just, I don't know if you can see this graphic currently sharing, um, but uh, they were saying that humans really love stability and infrastructure and transport and housing planning. We, we love to assume a very stable future and that what's happened before will repeat. And I think with the pandemic and the water crisis and, uh, unrest in various parts of the country. Uh, we all want to go back to the new normal, but the new normal doesn't exist. It's actually the new abnormal. And I think that's very difficult because um, planning and design uh, really sort of tests us because we, we're assuming that, uh, I think there's a, there's a term in economics, all other things equal. And so all, everything has to, uh, ceteris paribus for those that, that's uh, stuck through three years of economics. That's the entire uh, summary of my actual science degree. But, and so that's very difficult. And he, he said simply that shocks and stresses are just going to be a part of uh, the next uh, few decades, at least uh, of what we know. And so I think the first thing is admitting that there's no new normal. It's absolutely actually a new abnormal. Uh, and, and secondly, that the future is not an extrapolation of the past. So you can't just take the last five years of, let's say, water supply planning, environmental 
uh, let's say, uh, factors and insights. Uh, you can't just multiply that. And then secondly, there's thirdly, the assumption that the future is necessarily better and more stable than the past. So if we just keep, all keep telling ourselves that the new normal is, you know, COVID's going to go away this year and the next year is going to be normal again, uh, that doesn't, that's not true. And I think we've seen these in our inner cities. The inner cities are no longer what they used to be. Then we need to repurpose our inner cities. We need to repurpose public spaces for the future. Um, we need to embrace technology uh, in the way we do this. So I think that's really, uh, you know, the, the sort of, the, the premises that sort of shakes everyone up. And I think that's why we called, we, we gave this, uh, this year's edition guided by the SSC network, the theme of the rebuilt city. It's very provocative. What are we rebuilding? What broke down? <laughs> uh, did our systems break down? Did buildings break down? You know, why are cities attacked? Um, what are we rebuilding and why? Uh, but I think there's a very clear message from both the Deputy Honorable Minister and, uh, and the CEO, Sutole, that if we don't change how we are, going to rebuild going forward, if we don't innovate now, immediately, in the short term, in the medium and the long term to sustainability and resilience, um, we will simply miss another 10 or 20 years of, of the progress we should have made and the benefits we should have received from urbanization. So I think, um, I, I think that's sort of uh, the answer. There is no stability. <laughs> um, and so you have to make the best. And I think that's what resilience, resilience means being tough. Um, but being tough in a crisis is not necessarily having perfect infrastructure. Um, I think we've all seen you know, the power of a WhatsApp group, you know, connection, suddenly everyone could work from home. Uh, that's soft infrastructure that get, builds us resilience so people can work from anywhere, they can communicate. Um, unfortunately, sometimes we're a bit too available, but, um, and so sustainability and resilience is what can we do with what we have Let's not make new plans. We don't need a, entirely new plans. Let's dust off those plans to improve transport, to make interchanges safer, to um, ensure there's no overcrowding on transport, as an example. But let's realize that we're constantly dealing with punches and let's become a bit tougher uh, through hard and soft infrastructure, basically. And, and maybe, I mean, I guess just a, a question to you and also to uh, as tall as we get to just to wrap up, I guess, our interview. I mean, South Africa is the most unequal society in the world. And a big part of rebuilding, I would think, has to confront that polarity. Um, so these shocks that we've seen uh, over the last 15 years, the depth of the emergency type of governance that we need would be experienced in different ways, for instance, in Clifton, in relation to, say, Philippi. And I'm quite interested, I guess, within our city's frameworks. Um, how does this notion of rebuilding and reinventing what cities are, both spatially and I guess in what we want them to achieve, how does it deal with that? Um, the deep inequity of, you know, uh, I guess, life and service coverage and just, you know, life opportunities in South Africa. Let's start off with you, uh, 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 Rashik, uh, Rashik, and then uh, we'll get some remarks from Stop. I'll be quite quick. I think. Um, you start by starting <laughs> and, and recognizing that there's inequity. Uh, the inequity is not always as simple as we think that is uh, purely income or purely um, The inequity is, is time. Uh, uh, so if you're traveling two and a half hours to work every day um, and two and a half hours home, you don't have the luxury of the inequity is not purely on an income basis. You know, 40% of income spent on transport. If we just make transport cheap, we need to also make transport efficient. So how do you guarantee travel times for somebody living 30 kilometers away, you know, through a dedicated bus lane, or for example? So how do you guarantee a quality of life um, and give buses, trains, minibus, taxis the preference during peak traffic? And that's very difficult to do. And that doesn't require big infrastructure. Guarantee that somebody getting on a minibus, taxi, or a bus in any community 20 to 30 kilometers away has the luxury of time and cut their travel time from two hours to 30 minutes. It shouldn't take, I mean, we've all traveled to the airports and cars and Ubers when there's no traffic. It's really, you know, 25 to 35 minutes with no traffic. So let's guarantee that for the majority. And that originally, that immediately gives people, that reduces inequity. We, we can't overnight overturn 300 years of oppressive top-down planning, which marginalized most of our country and its people. But we can give people equity through time. And then you mentioned Philippi, for example. You know, Philippi is surrounded by uh, a massive aquifer, uh, which is water under the ground, and some of the best urban farmlands. And so let's 
protect that in a rational manner while, meet, while sort of dealing with the needs for housing. Uh, if I think of um, perhaps our context in particular in Cape Town, Mitchell's Plain and Kailicha are actually beachfront communities. You know, they're wrapped in beaches. And so I think we must be a bit cleverer about uh, the sort of static narrative that, um, you know, that communities have no hope, that there's no chance to break down um, the, the decades of inequity built into our fabric of our cities. And I think that's sort of what the SA Cities Network also does with all its cities and partners. It asks those questions and helps them to break that down. And I think, uh, yeah, I think Salot Tolle has a, has a bit more to say on that. Thanks. Sure, sure. See you. Thanks, Ayabonga. Uh, can I perhaps just uh, steal a, a word that Rashik has so um, ably used, which is uh, extrapolation. Um, <clears throat> I think for us to be able to achieve equity, we're gonna to have to design it. It's not going to happen all on its own. Uh, and it, can, it cannot, as he correctly says, be an extrapolation of what has happened in the past when in fact the circumstances that Deputy Minister is talking to have changed because what was designed in the past was designed for those circumstances and now the climate is different. Practically, I think we're gonna have to move away from just sloganeering around the notion of all of society, whole of government. Um, and for that to happen, I think you need very strong leadership. You need strong political leadership. You need a very strong civil society leadership. You need a very strong business citizen leadership. And I'm using the word business leadership purposefully because I don't want to say the private sector. Uh, I think, and I think the confluence of, 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 of all these types of leadership united by something which is the desire to meaningfully change society would for me, make or break um, us being able to achieve this equity. And there's many examples to learn from and, and they are not necessarily perfect even at this point in time in South Africa. If, if you look at the transformation of sports, for instance, it's a very difficult uh, topic. But even during the days of non-racial sports, when we, we were advocating for non-racialism in sports, one of the arguments that we were making was that, what's the point of pulling your top competitive teams that have to compete internationally from a few sample of your population when you actually have a huge sample? It's the same logic therefore, right? That for us to grow the economy, we have to make everybody put shoulder to the wheel around the economy. For us to achieve social cohesion, everybody, uh, not just leaders, but everybody has to be made um, and engineered mentally and otherwise to understand that a non-racial society is more beneficial, has a better return on investment than a society that is divided. And, and you, can, you, you can utilize virtually each and every lever that you can think about to give effect to the fact that where there is unity, there's more to achieve rather than where you are acting as, 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 as remnants um, uh, 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 in, in, in a society. And, that, and that's why I think if you think about it, our international relations policy is premised on humanity and, and nothing else other than humanity because that's what binds us as anthropological beings. You know, CEO, I, th I think this issue of circumstances and how what we think about rebuilding and on the basis on which we rebuild it responds to circumstances is something I find very interesting. And the example that you're making is that if we want the future to be better than the past we come from, then it has to be a future that allows everybody to actively participate in really taking charge of their lives. What, what do you think, certainly from the experiences that you've had, um, and you know, this is the last question on my end for both you and Rashid, what do you think from the experiences that we've seen during this moment of uh, the pandemic, even the climate crisis, in particular the drought, 
uh, and preceding that, the global financial crisis. What are some of the things that I guess we've learned at a city level that we might want to bank, put in our pockets and take with us to that very uncertain future? For me, I would bank the notion of possibility, right? Um, you say I've, I've been in the Cities Network for 20 years and I can tell you I've, I've, I've seen many, but I've not seen all. But the one thing that I have managed to see across all the municipalities that I've ever had the, the, the privilege and the honor to work with is the possibility, the possibility to transform. Um, unfortunately, that agenda has become halted by the circumstances that Deputy Minister makes reference to in part, uh, by suddenly, amongst others, us gravitating back to our own laggers and seeking security, right? So there is possibility. There is nothing that is impossible that we as human beings can think of and be committed to and be led towards. I still believe in the vision of, of a finite racial society. I, and I, I strongly believe that it is achievable. And I was purposeful in utilizing the sports fraternity because you can practically see it. It's there. And it can then uh, be applied in other circumstances of life. Uh, yeah. Rashi? I think it's relationships that focus on action. I think. Uh, the, the sort of all of government, whole of society approach is not really, um, uh, it's not just a, a slogan or a strap line. Uh, so in reality, <laughs> and this is where it's difficult, it's, it's, let's say, forming relationships, let's say, on housing with social housing companies and government and uh, giving that new energy. So if you previously were delivering two buildings a year, you need to go up to 10 to deal with the backlog. Um, you need to speak to developers if you haven't spoken to them before. Uh, you need to speak to your municipalities around the cost of bulk infrastructure, especially when it's student housing, affordable housing. So relationships in, for action is really reaching across the aisle for lack of a better word, and, and uh, you know, talking to students and, and really uh, building those relationships, uh, focusing on, on action and delivery. And I think, I think we're, we're so attached to perfection sometimes that we're, uh, we're afraid of making mistakes. And I think we, we, as we've seen in the last, as Sotolia said, the last 15 years, it's several periods of emergency governance, or in fact, the entire period of emergency governance. We don't have that luxury of time. Um, and so we must build those relationships and partnerships every day uh, with, with the whole of society. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much. I see, I see the deputy minister's hand is up. Um, so, so, Deputy Minister, uh, please, uh, please come in here because uh, I think there must be something that has moved you in what Rashik and Sitole have said. No, no, definitely. And I'm glad that they've embraced uh, this uh, concept of fitting our plans into the circumstances and also acknowledging the, the current uh, period in which we find ourselves from this crisis to this crisis and past the crisis, uh, we need to then uh, develop. I just really wanted to also invite all, even beyond this uh, festival, uh, as and when uh, these agendas are unfolding in South Africa. We, we are trying to build one of the longest city uh, in South Africa coastal line called the Seaboard Development. The president will be launching it on the 12th and the 18th of November. But the location will be just at two sites. However, these two sites is 1,600 kilometers of development. It starts in Kosi Bay in KwaZulu-Natal, just on the border with Mozambique. It goes to Richards Bay, from Richards Bay to Teguini, uh, Teguini to Port, Port Shepstein on the KwaZulu Natal site. Then you enter Eastern Cape, it's Port, San, uh, Port Edward from Port St. John, uh, sort of from Port Shepstein to Port Edward in the Eastern Cape. Port Edward in the Eastern Cape to Port St. John, Port St. John to East London, East London to Trebeja, and that's the Eastern Cape uh, uh, front. Then from, uh, from Trebeja, then it goes to Western Cape 
George. And then from George, it goes to Cape Town and Cape Town goes to Saldana Bay. So that is the, the, the 1,600 kilometer development. And in it, there will be towns and cities uh, developing and uh, new developments along and then taking advantage of the ocean economy, but also Africanizing some of the spaces that we find there so that we don't kill the Africanization and also dealing with the urban rural divide uh, that is there and then ensuring therefore that the ruralness and the urban, they share the same technology and development and, and then you don't leave the rural people out and then only urbanize. Uh, so whilst urbanization is the agenda, obviously, which is imposing on us to then begin to prepare. And, 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 and then also the, the, then to deal with where we find ancient development, ancient cities and heritage sites to develop them so that we can then display what we have uh, as South Africa. So we will be inviting international scholars, uh, planners and uh, others to really to conceptualize on this development. It's a 25 year program uh, and, and therefore the space for everybody to come in. But the president will then be giving uh, the entire launch uh, that element starting at Port Edward and also Port St. John, both sides of the Eastern Cape and, and, and Port St. John. And we'll then see what happens. Uh, very beautiful production. But as, as a cities network, please be alive and be on the agenda. Uh, please uh, come in there in that space as soon as we can so that these ideas that we have developed over a period of time globally in the networks and, and uh, seminars and symposium that we have had, or webinars as we call them now today, uh, can they ideas really find expression because people have been engaged in webinars in hackathons. We have engaging students, we're engaging the rural communities, we're engaging the traditional leaders to then say what type of a city or a town or development for that matter, because it doesn't have to be a city or a town, but development and you know, being embraced as we modernize and we, as we embrace technology, but as we are also beginning to see uh, the benefits of as sharing experiences as well. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, uh, Deputy Minister. And I can see uh, the CEO, the nodding in agreement. So, so I guess CEO, that means uh, the city's network is certainly on board with that. But uh, I mean, I find that fascinating because in, in a sense, yeah, yes, CEO? I'm saying nodding in consideration. <laughs> oh, oh, not in agreement yet. OK. <laughs> no, I find it fascinating that I mean, you know, Deputy Minister, mm. but obviously you also have to agree understanding the details of, 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 of that. I agree that the, the, the rural urban interface needs to be facilitated. It's not going, we are not going to undo Bantustan development that was driven by apartheid spatial planning if we are not uh, uh, steadfast, if we are not, um, uh, as Rashik says, we have to be doing it, practicalizing it. So in principle, yes, uh, and the details uh, also need to be understood and beneficial. But thanks, Deputy Minister, for sharing that information. So it comes an almost announced first on the Eben Festival. <laughs> 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 Certainly, I, I hope all of my friends in the in the media are here, so that uh, at least they, they are the ones who get the exclusive from from, from the city's network. But but I want to thank Tole and uh, Rashik. Uh, we're going to have to maybe uh, close it here. But uh, I, I assure you, there's going to be fascinating, similar such discussions that we're going to be having over the next few days or so. And uh, I find uh, the remarks that the deputy minister makes fascinating, because in a sense, what such a you know over a thousand kilometer strip. Uh, of development means is, is that it, it overlaps over many corridors in our national spatial development framework uh, and really is going to require, I guess, the type of coordination and an alignment that comes with the, the district development model uh, and other, other IGR platforms that, that, that uh, the Deputy Minister was speaking about earlier on. So uh, certainly, I guess, uh, yeah, something to think about uh, and it uh, would be interesting to hear how uh, other sessions in our discussion over the next three days or so uh, uh, start to grapple and think about that particular issue. So let's pause here. Once again, thank you to the CEO of the South African Cities Network, Stolen Banga, and also to the curator of this uh, festival, uh, who will certainly hear from a lot more, Rashik Fatah, uh, who joins us from Our Future Cities. Uh, thank you very much. 
and we're going to have a brief interlude now uh, and uh, going to have a spoken word performance from Emma Mabie. But before we go there, we are out on social media platforms. Uh, so do check us out on our website on www.sacities.net, www.sacities.net. Also out on Facebook and LinkedIn, South African Cities Network, and uh, Twitter and Instagram at SA Cities Network, at SA Cities Network on Twitter and Instagram. And uh, we also uh, have the opportunity uh, over the next uh, while to uh, have a competition. And I'll say a bit more about that after Emma's performance. But allow me to uh, welcome Emma Mabie, uh, who is a Tswane based poet, uh, uh, to give us a spoken word performance. Uh, and uh, as uh, we briefly break for our cultural interlude. Emma, the platform is yours now. Thank you so much, Aiwanga. Good morning, everyone. It is an absolute privilege to be back at the Urban Festival 2021. And today I shall share a tale of the rebuilt city. A tale is told of the miraculous entry of bats from an unknown realm, which cast an enormous shadow over the city. White dust covered the land and infiltrated the lungs of man. Figures of power stood as mountains in the face of crises, imprisoning solutions, endangering a collective destiny, till death and decay became the companions of the land and fed on its people. Ancient folklore has it, Ra, the god of the sun, created an army by the fire in his eye that flooded the city, fueling everything in their path. Flames licked dry bones, dry bones sapped a readiness to birth, active building injected in their blood. The ground fertilized with potent seeds of possibility, till bravery and readiness became the ammunition to bring possibilities to life. Children's laughter was a reminder of how people ought to nurture their gardens. Man understood that nature was heritage from the gods and so became in sync with the environment. Green fingers, an imprint on their flesh. From the four winds came the goddess Ushun with all her creativity, marrying myth with reality, merging the obscene with sanity enabling man's energy to breathe new purpose into the city's empty historic structures. Today, the city stands, the people's culture infused in every corridor, their identity found in every alley, hunger for change, their currency, an empire thriving on advancing human development, symbolizing the spirit of human resilience, a city rebuilt. The South African Cities Network, Department of Cooperative Governance and Department of Human Settlements and Partners welcomes you to Urban Festival 2021. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Emma, uh, for that uh, uh, rendition there of uh, uh, that poem. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, and uh, as you can hear, I guess, even in uh, that uh, uh, a contribution there by Emma, this uh, uh, golden thread of possibility. Uh, and I think a big part of what the next three days are going to be about um, is about exploring what is possible, uh, but more importantly, what is possible in the context of responding to the type of circumstances uh, that our cities are faced with and that our spatial environment uh, is faced with as well. Uh, we now have the opportunity uh, to get uh, a lecture from uh, Dr. Luyanda Mpatwa, who's joining us from Design Space Africa. Dr. Mpatwa, Maskwamkele, let us welcome you this morning as you give us your lecture. And thank you very much for kicking us off today. And look forward, I guess, to hearing your contribution on how we can design for recovery, rebuilding, and I would further say, I guess, for our continuing tasks of reconstruction. Dr. Mpatwa, the platform is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you and, uh, and, and good morning and <clears throat> good morning to you, um, uh, Wonga. Thanks for, for, for the introduction. Um, and, and obviously, um, it's been quite a, a pleasure to, to listen to the opening remarks by, by the Deputy Minister. Um, and, and, and I think the discussion um, that followed 
has kind of, um, in a sense, given me uh, enough um, to, to in, in, you know, as a follow up uh, on, on, on what I'm going to contribute. Um, yes, it is recorded as a lecture, but I mean, you know, I, I regard it as more reflections and provocations because I think we're all trying to find solutions to very, very complex processes. So I've prepared a few slides, which, which I'd, I'd like to share. Um, they are not slides that are, are, are meant to, in a sense, um, influence our thinking, but they are slides that are guiding me in my thought process. Uh, I'd like them to be, to be seen like that. So I'm gonna try and share and see if, uh, This uh, helps. So um, is the slide visible? Yes. Any yes, we can see it. Yes, we can see it, Dr. Ampar. OK, thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, I've, I've been given a very difficult topic, actually, um, which is about defining recovery and, and, and rebuilding. And, and, and I thought I should just give my reflections on, on, on what I think. Um, I think um, in terms of just dealing with, with this, you know, it's been broken down into, into three kind of sections or themes. Um, one is designed for recovery and, and rebuild resilience. And I think in the discussions um, um, with, with Rashik and the CEO, it became very clear what challenges we, we are facing. And then the, the other aspect is defining the recovery itself, um, which I think is something that we need to, to kind of address. And, and that is going to be actually the first part of what I want to talk about. And then what are the opportunities to build better, build back better? Uh, I, I'm not sure about the back, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll take it as it comes. Now, in terms of defining recovery, um, I've really given this a thought, and, and the question is, it's recovery from what? Um, and and in, in what I've thought about, I really think that it, it actually starts with understanding the crisis. And it's actually a series of crises. It's not only just one crisis. Uh, that, that's my take on it. Um, and, and the big question is, how do we get out of these crises? Um, and then I, I, I guess the next step for me is just acknowledging the failures and weaknesses in our system. And, and I mean, if you do not look at how you've been performing, um, looking at the good things you've been doing, but also looking particularly at the failures and weaknesses, I don't think you, you, you can actually face the future with, with, with certainty. And then I think there's, there's issues of strategic thinking on recovery. What are the key issues? Um, um, and, 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 you know, both the introductions by the deputy minister have highlighted some of these issues, but also I'm of the view that we need to engage creatively. And this platform, the Urban Festival, for me provides that opportunity so that we can, we can also define what are the things that we regard as part of the truths that we need to be facing as we move forward as a people, as a country, but also as well. Now, what is the series of crises that we're dealing with? I mean, the immediate crisis obviously is a pandemic, which as we all know, um, has exposed the fragility of society in many ways, economically, um, socially, culturally, it has, it has just exposed uh, the, 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 the very fragile nature of our world. And, and, and also because the world is interconnected, something which is reported as having started in China has affected all of us. Um, no one actually knows um, whether it did start there. But these are all the, the, the complexities of the world we live in. Um, I'm of the view that uh, the role of states, the role of the state has come to the fore because we've all been looking at how the state is responding 
in terms of finding ways to protect us from the pandemic. Um, we've been having family meetings. Um, I think every South African knows what a family meeting is. It used to be a, a matter of African families or maybe in the, in the, in the African culture uh, or maybe certain families even there, not all of them. But we now have a sense that if the president speaks, it's a family meeting. These are interesting things uh, in my observation. But there's also been the polarization that is cropped in, in, into the whole picture where polarization, even in the language we use, I mean, we used to, I, I heard the CEO speaking about social cohesion, which was one of the big issues in the South African society. But at the same time, um, the pandemic has brought about social, dis um, social distancing, which I mean is, is for me a, a controversial term in itself because in our nature we're social beings. But now because we have to physically distance, there's also, you know, just the terminology social distancing for me has, has some issues that we need to, to think about. I mean, mask wearing, vaccination have become political issues. Um, there are people who have been vehemently um, opposing mask wearing, mask wearing in some countries. Um, vaccination has become a political issue. There's even vaccination apartheid people talk about where the Western countries, rich countries have, 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 have ordered vaccination and then you know, distribute whatever they don't need to poorer countries. These are issues that have just shown just how fragile our, our, our world order actually is. And, and I'm of the view that we need to look at the voices of civil society in this whole picture. Where does society fit in? And, and how do we, we feel personally affected by the fact that we were restricted by protocols. We now, um, some of us are fighting against vaccination and we feel it's a violation of personal freedoms. But actually, what are we saying uh, in, in terms of the threat that society is facing through, through, through this crisis? Now, I think that one of the big things for me out of this crisis is how do we rebuild trust? How do we rebuild trust in our system, in our society, in our government, in ourselves? Um, and, and, and I think it's going to be one of the things that we're going to have to look at quite seriously. There's another crisis, obviously the socioeconomic one where we've seen how COVID has hit the economy of the country uh, and, and we're looking at economic recovery, businesses have been hit very hard. We see inner cities with you know, boarded um, windows on the pavements because there's no business um, and others couldn't survive the, the, the economic stranglehold of the, of, the, of the pandemic. But also we see communities trying to rebuild their lives. And what has happened though, is that there is a worsening of inequality, which has become very, very clear. You know, we could social distance perhaps in, in some of the areas. I mean, I live in Rondebosch in Cape Town and it's quite easy to social distance. You've got a garden, you can, you can play outside, you can even do exercises outside. But we've seen how the impact of that in, 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 in marginalized areas and townships. Um, talk about informal settlements and, and, and you actually realize that even the issue of that social distancing or physical distancing becomes relative because do you want the people inside the shack or do you want them outside where there's fresh air? And these are all things that I think uh, are bringing us to think a little bit more about the urgency of dealing with some of the challenges that we're facing. I mean, these are pictures that are, again, not new to, 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 to us. Um, I mean, Johnny Miller has, has done amazing work in terms of just kept capturing the, the, the kind of spirit of South Africa that we still live with. The historic crisis of inherited spatial inequalities that are still evident today and, and have been actually worsened or exposed perhaps by the pandemic. And I'm of the view that if we don't focus on the marginalized communities, people, um, settlements, um, we are not going to be able to get out of this uh, crisis and, and recover. It's not going to be possible. 
Now, the other crisis is obviously cities are in crisis. Um, you know, what is the future of the inner city post COVID? Um, our cities or inner cities are characterized by the CBD, so called Central Business District, which essentially is the commercial zone of the city, where actually we all drive in every day to go and work and drive back out. Um, and then Rashid has raised the issue of of public transport um, and its accessibility and availability and the cost that is associated with it. Uh, I mean, everybody knows who works in this kind of urban space that the poorest of the poor spend 40% of, of their wages on transport. Um, now, this is a serious issue. So, so our cities are not geared for anyone to actually live in them. Johannesburg has got 5.6 million people, close to 6 million. 300,000 live in the inner city. Um, and, and, and those are not your highly economically viable who live in that city. Cape Town has got also about 4, 4.5 million people. Um, shockingly, only 80,000 live within the inner city of Cape Town. That is including City Bowl, Atlantic Seaboard, um, that is nothing. Um, so basically our cities are not, these are now crises that have, have been there even before the pandemic, are not meant for people to live in. But now that we're facing um, the crisis of COVID, how, how, how do we deal with this kind of city that is monofunctional, that is only a, a, a space where we come to work and not to live. What is the future of it? Just as of Monday, I mean, I read an interesting article um, um, in, 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 in one of the, the, the media um, outlets, um, which, which talks about how Johannesburg suburban elites maintain apartheid inequities. This is all stuff which is still real, relevant that our cities are, inequal, are unequal. And it, it, it goes on to really talk about, you know, how business or developers or whomsoever, the wealthy hoarding taxes and undercutting development boundaries, and then how this undermines uh, the, the governing of the city. Um, so, so this leads to other socioeconomic realities. You look at uh, the dichotomy between Gibbs Lord versus Four Ways or Alex versus Sandton. You can talk about the Cape Flats in Cape Town versus, you know, the suburbs and all this. And, and this was quoting the late mayor of Joburg, the late James Makulu, who was quite starting to be quite articulate in terms of how one can start looking at the governance of the city and the tax base and all those issues in terms of how do you make a city like Johannesburg to be viable. And we know that the city of Joburg is in crisis. Um, it has lost its shine. I mean, it's, it's <sighs> Joburg is in a mess. We all know this, but talking about post-COVID, the inner city vacancies in terms of office space in Johannesburg as we speak, and, and this is not just because of COVID, but just because of the flood of capital from the inner city to other areas, Rosebank, Santon, and, 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 and Waterfall and everything, is about a million square meters of empty office space. So what are we going to do with this space? Because all our cities, and that's not only Joburg, have got massive office space that is that that I mean has characterizes the city. But if you drive down Joburg, you you actually this is in February this year in Joburg, um, and and just driving through the streets, you just actually find that the city is a, in a real crisis of existence. Um, the infrastructure is falling apart. Um, and, 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 and there's just no incentive to invest in the city. And I'm asking myself, how does the city, what is the vision from the city's perspective to deal with this crisis? The crisis of existence also includes other office space that has been standing vacant for years, which is not occupied, it's falling apart. Um, and, and therefore you ask yourself, Joburg is going to remain the economic hub of South Africa, I guarantee you. But what is the vision for it? What is the strategic thinking around the 
city of Johannesburg, but also of the country in terms of where do we want the city to go? Where do we want the city to be in the next five, 10, 15, 20 years? I, I do not see any vision for it that I can speak of. And, and the question is, where does that vision come from? Does it come from just government, political structures? What is the role of civil society? What is the role of business? I'm working in that city right now. And, and I'm finding that it's very, very difficult to find that kind of uh, strategic thinking in terms of where the city is, is, is going. And, and that existence is, is about collapsing heritage as well, where buildings of heritage significance are falling apart, have been taken over by, 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 <laughs> by life, by people. Um, and, and this is right at the heart of the economic hub. So where do we want to take the city as we're looking to rebuild uh, uh, towards recovery? Cape Town perhaps um, has got a different sense of, of, of urban reality in terms of the inner city. It's no different in terms of it being an inner city of work and where people come to work, but it still has some semblance of urban quality, as we all know, because the city is, 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 is structured quite differently from Johannesburg. And, and I think it's, it's, its economic base is also different from that of Johannesburg. And I mean, the same problems, however, remain. I mean, you know, there are a lot of offices that um, um, uh, are existing in, 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 in Cape Town as well, old ones and new ones. Um, this, this one has just been recently uh, completed on, on, on the left-hand side. It's, 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 it's standing empty right now. I mean, I, I do not know if if the, the new owners have actually moved in there because no one is working in offices. Uh, this one, which is an old standard bank, quite an architectural masterpiece in terms of the Cape Town inner CBD, um, is being converted into apartment blocks already. And that's a sign that, that you see outside of the building. This building completed recently also uh, owned by a bank, uh, two banks actually. Um, I wonder who is going there at the moment because no one is, is, is working from offices and we know that banks have not gone back. So what is going to happen to all this, this extra space? And, and at the same time, the, 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 the crisis of Cape Town maybe also has a different sense of crisis of identity. What, what does this city want to be? Uh, who does it want to uh, respond to? Who does it want to cater for? Because when you enter Cape Town, obviously you've got the CBD, but to your left, you've got the open um, piece, which is um, at the heart of, 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 of pain and suffering in Cape Town, which is characteristic of most cities, uh, District 6, um, which was cleared in the 60s and 70s, um, after you know the introduction of group areas and people were moved from District 6, still a very thorny, um, discussion in Cape Town has not been solved. Um, and, and whether you talk about Sophia Town, whether you talk about Cato Man, or you talk about any South African city, you're going to find that there is a spot like this. So what does the city want to be? Um, there are efforts to rebuild District 6, um, and obviously the issues of reparations and, and, and restitutions are, are at the heart of it, but at the same time, this is a very, very um, important and critical piece of land right on the, on, the, on, the, on the periphery of the city where the city could accommodate those who need to be included into the city. But the question is, how do you do it? Um, it it's been left to the Department of, 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 of Culture and Land Affairs to deal with this issue. It's not being resolved there, but at the same time, we've got local communities, but you've also got the city, which is trying to find ways of how to make the city inclusive. The identity crisis is just, um, you know, uh, difficult to define. I mean, in District 6, some life has, 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 got, has, has, has got back. Uh, some people have been able to, 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 to get back um, some of the properties they owned and, and people are living there. The question is, this is right at the heart of the city. 
Should we be recreating District 6 as it was in the 50s and 60s? Or should we be using the opportunity to look at other ways in which to rebuild the city and, and, and densify and integrate more? Um, and, and the jury is open. I have my own views, which I'm not going to express here, but this is what is happening. The other crisis, obviously, homelessness is, is everywhere. And this is right at the doorstep of District 6. So you can actually see that in part of the desire to get back to the city and address the issues of forced removals. You, you have people that find that their life is in the city and they want to be accommodated in the city. Um, how do we deal with these issues? What, what, what governance framework is there to deal with, with these issues because it is right on our doorstep? Talk about marginalized uh, societies um, and communities. And um, this is Filippi, which um, uh, Rashik has mentioned. I'm, I'm currently working there on an informal settlement upgrade project for human settlements. And I mean, the reality there is that people are everywhere. Anywhere where there's a piece of land, people are going to find a way to settle. Whether it's on top of railway tracks and you have to cross the railway line to go to the toilet, as you see here. Um, People need to be accommodated and the city has to find ways to accommodate them. So, so the agency of the recovery is going to be about how do we deal with these challenges with agency and, and what strategies do we have uh, in terms of how to integrate these communities. So, so for me, um, you know, uh, uh, coming back to now the second thing, which is designed for recovery and build resi resilience, um, we, we have to find ways to design for it. And, and I think one of the key issues is finding the governance mechanisms to do this. Um, we're all talking about creating sustainable, integrated, and inclusive cities. And we do have some good frameworks. Um, COCTA in particular has developed the IUDF, which is the Integrated Urban Development Framework. But how do we actionalize it? Are all the departments in South Africa, public works, human settlements, actually adhering or complying or supporting the IUDF? Where I work, I do not see it because, you know, everything is very much, um, you know, isolated. Um, when you work with human settlements, their mandate is to develop and build residential developments, human settlements. But the IUDF calls for integrated development, which includes other aspects, whether it be commercial, whether it be informal trading, whether it be, you know, ensuring that there are places of instruction, there, 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 there are community facilities, there's education, all the things that you would find in a normal development. The, 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 the IUDF actually has created a very incredible framework for this to happen. But are we actually applying it? I have my doubts. Um, and, and, and we have to find a framework for actionable programs. Um, we shouldn't just focus on having good policy, but how to implement it. And also ensuring that the critical voices of civil society are actually integrated into that process. Are there actual safe, safe spaces for critical dialogue so that we can criticize the deputy minister where we feel some of the policies they are putting across are not entirely well thought through from the perspective of various vantage points. As professionals, we, we have to find a way of how do we engage with the department. And I mean, we welcome the invitation by the deputy minister that we, we, we are going to be invited to participate, but where, how, how is this going to happen? Uh, so that if you talk about that 1,600 kilometer kind of development, how do we ensure that it fulfills and meets all the other aspects of development other than just, it's a development we're going to announce? What, what, are, the, what are the platforms that are going to be created where we can deal with these issues? I did mention the issue of the, the marginalized and how we need to prioritize this. I think social cohesion has been mentioned. Um, uh, inclusion is critical. 
and, and that is going to help us to rebuild the trust, which I think we, 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 we so urgently need. And, and, and again, I mean, you know, we've got a lot of policies on job creation, uh, which are a part of the economic stimulus that, that, that government, you know, announces. But this, in my opinion, um, should not be just about handouts, but we have got to build capacity and, 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 and ensure that the society is involved in some way, whether it be in the decisions or in the implementation, not just in terms of expanded public works. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how do we develop lasting partnerships? And, and I mean, South Africa um, uh, for a long time has been speaking about the private-public partnership as the kind of means of delivery. I actually think we should, we should do away with it and perhaps introduce three-way partnerships where you actually bring in civil society to be part of that process. The PPP route, private sector will only do stuff that makes sense financially. Obviously government is, 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 is fulfilling the mandate of the constitution in terms of ensuring that it provides the services that are required. But where does civil society fit in all this? Because this is where the action actually happens. So we need to align expectations in my opinion. The role of the state versus civil society has got to be addressed because we look so much to the state to do stuff for us that we actually forget that we've got a role to play in civil society. And how does that civil society contribute to policy making? And then, I mean, the, the, the other new thing, I mean, maybe it's in line with what the deputy minister was talking about, you know, the phenomenon of smart cities, which is gaining momentum. How are these characterized? How do we define this? How do we Africanize this as it is being spoken about? And, and what platforms are there for us to actually discuss and really dissect what these smart cities seek to do? And then as part of rebuilding the resilience, um, we, we have got to look at climate change focus. Um, all government programs now are about building green. We have to find out how. And, and the only way we can do so is by if we also support research and development of alternative affordable and sustainable building technologies and materials. That's a world I've been working in for the last 10 years. And I see very little movement on that, to be honest. We need to build capacity and human resources on strategic thinking on sustainable issues and sustainable programs. Um, and, 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 and that has to cut across at government level, at professional level, at even private sector level. We need that capacity. And we need to therefore partner with universities and research agencies um, so that we can, we can strengthen uh, that kind of visionary thinking on sustainability. We, we, we shouldn't sloganeer about it and we don't have even the people to execute it, whether it be officials in the department or us as professionals, do we actually act in terms of that sustainable thinking or we just do what the developer wants to do? You know, is our development vision driven or is it developer driven? These are the issues that we need to answer. And, 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 and then in, in terms of the last theme, which is, you know, building, building better, um, there, there has to be kind of some systematic way in, in, in which we do this. You know, we need to find the levers of change. And, 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 and this will include for me designing systems rather than just buildings. As architect, I mean, I'm an architect and I love buildings, but the reality today is that you've got to also think about designing the systems within which the buildings operate, your environment, your built environment, your contextual understanding, uh, cities should be more integrated in order to be sustainable. Um, these are all the things that we need to think through. Of course, we inherited cities that are not structured like that, but we have to have a process in terms of what is the vision for a Cape Town, for a Joburg. And, and, and I did mention the issue of developing new partnerships moving away from just a straightforward PPP strategy, introduce you know, three-way partnerships, look at cities in terms of affordability. Can people afford to live in the city? And how do we avoid urban sprawl? I mean, we're spreading all our developments further and further away from the city, increasing the trajectory uh, of movement you know, from those areas into the inner city where people work. We have to rethink all this stuff. 
And I think inclusive leadership, inclusive management strategies need to be executed so that the voices of civil society can become louder and become more involved in, in, in the processes we're following. And then I think this is the last one, which, which is really about, you know, one of the key drivers to that sustainability and resilience, in my opinion, is the energy crisis, which is the biggest crisis to climate change, in my opinion. Um, and, and, and energy certainties is one of them, where, where we have to look at how do we, you know, ensure economic recovery when there's actually energy uncertainty in South Africa. And we talk about the energy mix and it's always about nuclear and the rest, but actually who drives the energy agenda? Um, you know, how, what are the, again, you know, what platforms are there to discuss these issues? Because if we're talking about an energy mix, we've got to find a way of how do we integrate renewable energies into the whole process and actually say that it's not a question of coal or renewable, nuclear or this, but how do we really bring this into kind of one kind of um, concept of energy in order to ensure energy security for, for the country? That, that brings it to the end of, 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 of my talk and um, I'll hand over to you, Ivan. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tampatla, for, for those remarks. And uh, I think giving us a lot to think about there. There's already a series of questions that have come through and I wanna uh, just keep you on the line briefly, uh, Dr. Tampatla, just sure. to maybe field some of those questions. One of those no uh, relates, of course, to uh, Michael and Duwalana's question, who says, 20 years into democracy, how can we as professionals in the built environment and urbanists change the contemporary city's fragmented urban fabric into an integrated and compact one. Um, and then he follows up and says, you know, it's more likely that at least three fifths of metros will be run by coalition. How do we deal with some of the, I guess, political challenges that come with coalition governments um, and build these better to solve our urban crises rather than a majority rules type of approach? So let's take those questions and then uh, we'll take a look at some of the other questions that have come through in the chat. Yeah, thank you. I, th I think this is at the heart of it. I mean, you know, we, we've become so programmed to think politically that we, we, we seem to think that uh, our answers are going to lie on, on, on how our political landscape looks like, which probably is true in the, in the South African sense. But I, I really would like us to think beyond that and, and, and get um, a mindset that says, yes, politics is what, or political parties or, or government is, is what delivers service to us. And this is the commitment governments make, but it's got to be a, a multi-pronged process. And, and I think what I'm advocating for is that um, for, for civil society to have a voice, we've got to find platforms where those voices can actually be expressed. At the moment, I think it is very difficult to find those besides or outside of the political parties. So I think, you know, uh, even as we are heading to elections and everything, it is, it is gonna be very critical for us to, 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 to actually understand that, yes, uh, I'm gonna put my vote because I love the party that I'm voting for and, and I'd like it to be the government party. But on the other hand, how does the political system create opportunities for us to be able to express ourselves? And, and I don't have an answer for it. It's, it's, it's a provocation, it's a question because even I as a professional myself, an architect, uh, belonging to the Institute of Architects, I'm registered with SACAP. I'm the past president of the Institute. It's been very difficult to even engage with government on some of the issues that affect my profession. And, and this is a difficult issue to deal with. And, and, and I think we need to improve on that and improve on it very quickly because there is frustration out there. You know, when you talk about economic recovery, talk about how professionals have been affected by the pandemic, then you'll start understanding what the crisis actually is. So, so we need to find those. And I mean, I will never underplay the role of politics because you know, politics is what has made us and it is what actually will, will help us to look 
into the future. But but you look at how our system is working, how local governments are, and it it's a crisis of of capacity as well, in my opinion, which we need to build and build quickly. There's been another question that's come through from Ashley Nkwe, uh, and I guess two sets of questions. I mean, the first one is he speaks about what the deputy minister was suggesting earlier um, around the 1,600 kilometer ocean development corridor. Um, and I guess that sort of is overlaid on what might be the coastal development uh, or coastal transformation corridor, as it's called, uh, from Port Shepson or Port Edward right through to the other side of Kadeja as well. Um, and one of the things that Ashley is raising is you know, you might have here an anchor for the entire national spatial development framework. How does that, I guess, resolving some of those policy issues affect many of yourselves as professionals and the ability uh, to not only just plan your contributions now, but to also maybe forecast what that what might be required of you uh, probably in the next 25 year period? What I would hope for um, from the invitation by the deputy minister is that um, that broad framework that is going to be announced by the president for the coastal development is however going to be underpinned by very uh, critical, relevant and local aspects of planning that are going to characterize. We can't see it as we're developing the Kems Bay from, from Cape Town to Richards Bay. It, it can't be that. It has to be underpinned by what are the local conditions? What, 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 is the, what are the different characteristics of the different parts of the country? You go to the Eastern Cape, I'm from the Eastern Cape, Wild Coast. It's, it's the most amazing experience. And if you're going to imagine it fully developed, if one just takes development in, the, in, the, in, in just general sense, you're actually getting worried. What's going to happen to that wildlife and that wild coast that is, is very, uh, kind of um, authentic. So we need to engage at, a, at, a, at another level in those issues as professionals with government, understanding the framework of what is being intended. But the question is, where are these going to happen? Because what is I foresee happening is going to be a tender that is going to be made public and then developers are going to come and they're going to develop that. But the engagement that is necessary I'm asking myself, at what level is it going to happen? And of course, I would think there are trade-offs, uh, trade-offs around different visions of development and visions of what different spaces in localities and even across corridors are aimed at looking like, uh, I mean, as we see in some of the contests in that part of the world. Um, but uh, Dr. Mpatra, I want to thank you uh, for the remarks that you've shared with us today. It is unfortunate that we have run out of time. It would have been great, I guess, to, to go into uh, some of these issues in a bit more depth. Um, and I guess the next three days or so will also give many of our participants an opportunity to unpack a lot of this a bit further, to deal with some of the issues that you've raised. I mean, one of the uh, comments that you made, which I found quite interesting, is who determines uh, the priorities in our energy transition? It's going to be a defining transition for the next you know, few decades, if we accept that South Africa, I guess, is a economy characterized by the minerals energy complex. Well, what does that mean now as we undertake this transition and who is you know, setting the tone and uh, the pace of that particular discussion? I think it's, it's something that we're gonna have to think about because it sometimes is always very at a high level and we might have to concretize it um, even in programs like the informal settlements upgrade partnership. What does it look like in that context? Um, so I want to thank you for, for sharing your insights with us today and maybe i feel like you want to comment on that one. so let me give you 30 seconds no 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 it's, it's really just to thank thank um the cities network and, and and the event festival for inviting me i mean it's it's always difficult discussions that are very very difficult to compress in a, in a very short space of time um I, I hope this was helpful but i hope that it's going to create hopefully other platforms and channels through which we can take these things further. All, all I could do is to raise issues which I think are pertinent to, to, to what I was asked to do and then hope that we can take it further and I'll, I'll continue listening um, as much as I can to the festival and the deliberations and best of luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that there is Dr. Luanda Mpashwa uh, joining us uh, today uh, and uh, yeah, a real pleasure I guess to have had 
uh, these opening sessions. I certainly hope that it sets the tone for the next uh, few days or so. Uh, we're going to take a brief break now uh, just to give everybody an opportunity to go grab some coffee, have a bit of a body break, and uh, we will return uh, to our session uh, hereafter. Um, and uh, my job also, I guess, as the MC uh, ends at this point for today. But uh, I will be back with you again in the morning tomorrow. Uh, for our opening session then. So till we meet again, thank you very much and do enjoy uh, uh, the uh, coming sessions for today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, one last thing before everybody dashes off. Um, we, we are monitoring some of the questions that are coming through and uh, it's been fascinating to see some of the engagement. Uh, and there will be a selection by the curators and the organizers of this festival of some of the good questions that have come through every day and uh, you'll stand a chance to win uh, a book uh, and it so happens to be my book so um, yeah thank oh, you to okay. the South African Cities Network for that you will get a chance to win uh, 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 my book The Economy on Your Doorstep uh, so do certainly continue to send through your questions even in some of the sessions we'll have uh, uh, in the latter part of this morning and the afternoon uh, and you might be able to bag yourself I guess a free copy of the book so let's pause here for now take a brief break and uh, we'll be back uh, in the next few minutes or so I'm first in line for it and thanks so much <laughs> Thanks, boss. <laughs> sure, sure. Cheers. Thank you.